All right, another example, just basic simple harmonic motion. This was really easy, but there are things you need to know, so pay good attention. Here's your equation that you well know. It just says acceleration is a negative multiple of x, and actually should be mx double prime, so that should be k over m, okay? Now let's divide through by the m, k over m, right? So now we use x equals a e to the rt and plug that into the equation. Well, x double prime is r squared a e to the rt plus k over m a e to the rt equals zero. So r squared plus k over m equals zero. It's a quadratic equation, but you don't have any b term. You don't have any r term in the equation, right? So you can just say, so R, yeah. equals plus or minus the square root of negative K over M, right? And what's that equal? Omega. We are going to call the square root of K over M omega, but that's because what we know from physics and because we know simple harmonic motion, okay? But what we have is this, imaginary. If you don't understand where that I comes from, figure it out. I'm not going to explain it. So, square root of K over M is a clumsy thing to keep writing, and we, of course, know that the interpretation of omega is angular frequency. But even if we don't know that, we're going to use some symbol, and everybody in the world uses omega. Okay? Even the Chinese? Well, I was going to say, except the Greeks, who probably use W. <laughs> and that's a, never mind it. This is a Greek symbol. I'm sure the Greeks probably use omega. Chinese? Depends whether they're writing in English or not, but they probably use omega. Okay? And they probably don't write their mathematics in Chinese characters. I hope not. Now, they might well write their explanation in between equations, but they probably write their equations in the same alphabet we do. Okay? I'm trying to think if I have a Chinese journal. I know I have some Japanese journals. They just send them to me. They want my advice. Uh, I think Dimitri's taken a Chinese course. Ask him. I know he was last, huh? I know he was last semester. The what? I know he was last semester. Well, I think it's a high school course. Yes. Yeah, so I, so I would it's imagine it's that it... Still going ask him. Okay? Ask him how, how the Chinese write their mathematics. Of course, it's probably not something he's seen. Okay? But it might be. You know, he might have seen it incidentally, and if he did, he would remember. Okay? Since he's adept at the mathematics and learning the Chinese, he'd have seen that connection. I would expect that he remembered. Okay, well, that's a, that's a digression. Okay. So we let omega equal the square root of k over m, right? equals e to the i omega or e to the negative i omega, right? So that the set spans all solutions. Now let's observe one thing. What's the degree of this equation, or the order? Sorry. Second. This second order, so we can fit two conditions. So now note. Let's 
second order equation, so they're two linearly independent solutions. Can fit two conditions. Like position and velocity. You can start a simple harmonic oscillator at some position with some velocity, right? If you start it at the same position with a different velocity, the function's going to be different. The position function. Right? Or if you start it with the same velocity at a different position, it's going to give you a different position function. Okay? And this has to accommodate it. Now you know that these functions are ultimately of the form like A cosine omega t plus phi. You know that from physics. So I'm going to get sines and cosines out of this. From now until you die, you know the Euler identity. Anybody want to tell me? Uh, e to the i theta. Okay, e to the i theta oh, yeah. equals pi. You're confusing that with the fact that e to the i pi. Okay. Okay. Equals negative one. Yeah. Huh? E to the i pi is negative, negative one. Negative one. Yeah. Would it be the cosine of pi? Because the sine of pi is zero, right? And the cosine of pi is negative one. E to the i pi equals negative one. Which, as Khan said, if this doesn't blow your mind, you have no emotions. One of my favorite quotes. Okay? How do you get this? That too. I was thinking capital, but I wrote alone. For the Taylor expansions of the exponential cosine and sine function, you plug in i theta for x, and the expansion of e to the x is going to be equal to the expansion you would get if you plug i theta in for the cosine expansion of the cosine and i theta in for the expansion of the sine. It's very simple. The algebra is very easy. You know what the Taylor expansion of the exponential is? Make sure you do and the cosine and the sine. Work it out every day until you can't possibly forget it. First time, it might take you a few minutes. After that, it only takes seconds. And it keeps reinforcing. After you're pretty sure you won't forget it, work it out once a week. For a year. Take you about 10 seconds. In your head. I mean, it really is that easy. Yeah, I remember it was, those three were about the easiest we could get. Yeah. Yeah, but you got to know. And you got to be that familiar with Taylor expansions just to breathe properly. <laughs> okay. Okay, so it's just something you need to know. You will need it. You will use it next year and later in this course. Okay? So you might as well get it now so you don't have to stumble over it later. It's that easy. Uh, okay. Well, from this... e to the i omega plus b e to the negative i omega equals
could be written like this and check me on that, okay? Let me just write out what this is, write out what this is, and then factor out the coefficients of the cosine theta and the coefficient of the sine theta. Or, with lack of ability to visualize things. It used to be that way, but it's getting there. Okay, uh, so you have arbitrary alpha and beta, which equals and I've been using theta, I should be using omega t, and when I did e to the i omega, I mean this obviously has a t in it, right? So everything I've said is true except what I wrote down. We have a t here, we have a t here, we have a t here. And theta equals omega t. Okay? Now the relationship between alpha and beta and A and B, and that's just two simultaneous equations. So you can make A plus B equal to any alpha, and A minus B equal to any beta you like. Just set A plus B equal to alpha, A minus B equal to beta, you can solve for A and B. And then for any alpha and beta, well, for any theta, sorry, for any D and phi, you can expand the cosine of theta plus phi, right? Using your sum of angles formula, and you're going to get something like this that gives you your alpha and beta, right? So from this, you could get this, you could get this, okay? Or from this, you get this, you get this. From any one of these, you can get all the others. So make sure you can. Again, it's not difficult, it's high school level algebra and trigonometry, okay? Except the tail expansion thing, which is simple, okay? And you need to be able to do that sort of thing. Otherwise, uh, you get into solutions to more complicated problems, okay? Now, you've got a simple harmonic oscillator in water. What's going to happen? It's going it's not to be gonna, dampened. It's going to damp. Okay? So, so this is one I'm going to ask you to work out. Damp simple harmonic motion. And I don't know what... Just like the one we had, because we take this out, this is just mx double prime equals negative kx, right? So this is just a simple harmonic oscillator with no damping, and then you damp it. Okay? And you probably make out a minus delta x prime because we talk about the net force, right?
and your net force is going to be in the direction opposite your x prime. What's that symbol there? It's a delta. Don't you speak Greek? Yeah. It's a lowercase Greek delta. Sometimes you use gamma. Depends on your context. It depends on whether you're talking about damping proportional to velocity or proportional to the square of velocity. We don't want to talk right now about damping proportional to the square of velocity because as soon as you square x prime, this is not linear anymore. And most of the equations we deal with here are linear. I mean, a lot of the separable and exact equations are. But mostly linear, especially when we get to second order. Very tricky to solve the ones that aren't linear. Okay? So we have that. How do we solve it? These are constant coefficients, second order, but x equal a e to the rt. And you're going to get mr squared minus delta r plus k equals zero, right? So that r equals delta plus or minus the square root of delta squared minus m k uh, k over m, 4 k over m. No. The way I've got this set up, it's negative 4 k m. I was about to divide through by m, but I didn't do it on delta. Okay. All this divided by 2 m. Right. This is real. This is your imaginary part. Again, provided delta isn't too big, because if delta is big enough, this is real, right? Well, that's what I'm going to probe with the problem you're going to do. But that's it. You just interpret this. And I'll give you leading questions that allow you to interpret it. Another equation. If you don't have delta, but if this is proportional to the square of x, how are you going to do that one? Well, You don't have an x term, so you can just let b equal x prime, right? Okay, sounds good. What kind of equation is this? First order. Separable. Okay. <coughs> So not a hard equation. But if you had an x in here like the kx with the square, you'd be out of luck. So I'm probably going to ask you something about this. Of course, I'll give you hints because we're just getting our feet wet. But I want you to see some of the algebra and some of the thinking that you need to do to apply the differential equations. Then sometime next week probably, after looking at a few more examples and a few more ideas, and we'll just get into the book and work through it systematically. But you'll have most of the ideas for the first couple of chapters. Well, probably not for the second chapter, but for a lot of the first chapter, and then the third chapter, which is where this stuff occurs. Okay? And really, I mean, this isn't all there is to the third chapter, but that's a big chunk of it. And the rest of the third chapter is basically... A lot of it is what you do if you don't have zero here. The non-homogeneous equation. Okay? Because you've got to use some variation of parameters, techniques, or undetermined coefficients. Undetermined coefficients are easy. Variation of parameters can get difficult. Okay?
it, it may be a little difficult to understand. Right now, we're picking the low-hanging fruit. We're doing the things that are easy that you can just understand based on what you know. Get you kind of a nucleus and get your feet on the ground so that you know what's going on when we get into these other techniques. If you know this, then when you get to the non-homogeneous equation, at least you've got a basis. And the first thing you do with the non-homogeneous equation is you throw out the non-homogeneous part and you solve the homogeneous equation. Okay? And then a lot of times you base your solutions on those with some more advanced techniques. Okay? Everything here so far is at the level of relatively easy second semester calculus. We haven't done any integration by parts. We haven't done any trigonometric substitutions, and we pretty much don't need to, unless you happen to end up having to integrate something. Okay?